Tonight's Bible reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. Now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to also go, they will accompany me. All right, everyone, up on your feet. I think you need a stretch. You've been sitting for a little bit, so have a stretch. Do a jog if you need to. I feel like I'd need to stretch if I was about to sit for a while. Have a good stretch out. And then stay open in 1 Corinthians 16. We're nearly at the end of our series in 1 Corinthians. Let's pray, and then we'll get into it. Father, thank you for this time now to look at your word and for this opportunity for you to grow us. We pray that you would work, that your spirit would be working in us, and we pray, God, that you'd give us energy to listen, give us the right attitude and the humility needed to sit under your word, give me energy to speak your word faithfully, and as well, may we have a heart that wants to change, a heart that wants to submit to you as our Lord. And we pray, God, that you would help us to do this in a difficult area sometimes in our life, in this area of money and giving. Please, God, challenge us. And please, may you make us into the image of Christ for your glory. Amen. Okay, in Malachi, in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 to 10, the people of Israel are accused of robbing God. And God says this to them. He says, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you, God? In tithes and offerings. And you are under a curse because you are robbing me, says God. So the people were not giving to God what he'd asked of them. And so they are accused by God as of robbing him. He says they are robbing him. That's pretty frightening. I want to ask you the question. Are you robbing God with how you use your money? Tonight, have that question in the back of your mind. Am I robbing God? If we don't use our money in a way that God wants, we are robbing Him because all is His. Now, tonight we're looking at money and giving. It's what's raised in the passage and it's one of those touchy topics at times. It's one that some churches talk, I think, too much about or other churches don't talk enough about. It can be a touchy topic. But it's a blessing that It comes up in our series through Corinthians, and so it's raised for us and we get to look at it, and it's a vital part in the Christian life. And I mean it when I say vital. We we might think, oh, isn't it a bit more of a side issue, something we can just forget about? No, it's not. It's not an optional extra. It's a vital issue issue in the Christian life, and that's because of all that we've been gifted in Jesus. When we realize what we have in Jesus and the gospel, then we realize that our generosity is to be a picture of the generosity and grace that we've received from God. And so it's not some side issue. It's a very important issue that this passage raises and addresses. So let's look at the passage. Now, to understand this passage, we have to get a bit of background in our heads because there's a few things that have gone on in the past and will happen in the future that will help us understand these verses here. So have a look at verse 1. It starts off, Paul begins saying, Now about the collection for God's people. Now, that first phrase there, that phrase, now about, it's come up a few times in the letter of 1 Corinthians, and Paul always uses that phrase when he's going to speak on something that the Corinthians has ra- have raised. So, if you remember, 1 Corinthians is like a response letter from Paul to this church, because they've written a letter raising these different issues and asking these different qu- questions. And so, it seems that the Corinthians here, 
have raised a question about this collection, the collection of money. And so Paul's going to address it. Now, who are they giving to and what are they collecting for? Well, verse 1 gives us our first hint, the collection for God's people. It's a collection for God's people. But verse 3 shows us where they're from. Have a look at verse 3. It says, there we see, the gift will go to Jerusalem. Okay, so it's a collection for God's people in Jerusalem. So maybe Paul had asked them to do this. Maybe they had heard of other churches doing this. Uh, But whatever the case, we see here they're going to be collecting money to give to the church in Jerusalem. But there are a few other passages on this collection that Paul was doing that shed light on this situation and what's going on. So I want to look at them. Uh, The first one that I think we need to look at is one in the next book along, 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, later on in the story, Paul is preparing the church. You can look there if you want. Paul's preparing the church there to make sure that they are ready for this group of people who are going to come and collect the money. So the Corinthians, they, it shows in those chapters, particularly at the beginning of chapter 9, that they had desired to give, and they were really eager to give. And Paul was happy about this. But he sees it's really important that he encourages them to really do this and stick to what they've said. And so he writes those things in 2 Corinthians, and he says, make sure you give as you have said, because their eagerness to give has encouraged others to give, like the Macedonians. It talks about there in that chapter. And so Paul sees it very important that this example isn't lost and that they fulfill the promise of giving. Then also in Acts, if you want, you can turn there. Acts 24, verse 17, we see Paul say this. He says, After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the, for the poor and to present offerings. So here we see Paul get to Jerusalem and Paul eventually does take all the collections that he had gathered to the church in Jerusalem. And here we see that the money that was being sent, in particular, it was being sent to God's people in Jerusalem. But if you look there in the verse, it says to those who are in need. Gifts for the poor. It was to those who are in need. And this seems to be a big part of Paul's missionary journey, his third missionary journey when he went around. A big part of it was this collection And we see this as well at the end of Romans. When he's coming toward the end of that journey, he says this in Romans chapter 15, which sheds a little bit more light on the situation and why Paul saw this as so important, this collection. Romans 15, verse 25 to 27, he says, Now, however, he's saying to the Romans, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the saints there, For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. It's the same point about this collection. And then he says, They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them in their material blessings. So there's Paul. He's showing a bit of insight as to why this collection is important. Now, I could say a few points about this, but there's a a commentator, I think, who summed this up really well. So let me read it. A guy called F.F. Bruce said this about this point. Paul obviously attached great importance to the collection. In his eyes, it was a proper acknowledgement on the part of Gentile Christians of the debt which they owed to Jerusalem, from which the gospel had set out on its progress to them. And he also, Paul also hoped that this collection might arouse in the Jerusalem church who looked on suspicion at the Gentiles and the mission to the Gentiles, he's hopeful that it might arouse in the Jerusalem church a sense of gratitude for the Gentile believers and therefore unite them spiritually and bring about unity. So Paul sees this collection as important for this reason, to bring about this unity. And we see some of those reasons there in Romans 15. Now, a few other passages relating to the collection before we get into some more of the detail. There's another passage in Acts that talks about a collection for those in Jerusalem. And so it seems, this is in Acts 11, verse 27 to 30, it seems like there was another situation where money was being given to this church. And also in Galatians chapter 2, at the end, Paul is told that to continue to remember the poor by the rulers of the Jerusalem church. And he says it's the very thing that he was eager to do. So there's a fair few references in the New Testament 
about this collection, about giving to the poor in Jerusalem. It's not a a small issue, it's something that's important and keeps coming up again and again in Paul's ministry. He saw it was important to remember the poor and to remember God's people here in need. And this is what he's seeking to do now in our passage, isn't he? He's seeking to see this church help him out in remembering the poor in Jerusalem, in remembering God's people who are in need. And so here, looking at the background and just seeing verse 1 and what the point is, we, we can quickly say the key point here for us, it's pretty clear, the key point here for us is to be an example for us on giving. The key point is that we as God's people should regularly give to God's people who are in need. And we're going to see that as we go throughout. That's the key point. But I think there's a lot of questions that come up about giving that I had around this passage as I studied it. And so I want to answer some of those questions as we look at this passage and other passages that relate to this passage on the collection. Okay, so the first question that I want to answer, and hopefully as we do this, we gain a bit of a theology on giving. The first question I want to answer is, what do we give to? Because there's so many things we could give our money to. There's so many agencies, missionaries, organizations, so many things that are pulling for us to give to, maybe people at the shops. Sometimes it's hard, isn't it, knowing what to give to? What do we give to? What do we give our money to? How should we use our money as Christians? Well, there's a few ways that the Bible talks about how we should. Firstly, at the top of the list, we are to provide for our family. 1 Timothy 5.16 shows that families should support widows in them so that the church doesn't have to support those widows but can support the widows who are in need and don't have family. But also 1 Timothy 5 verse 8 says, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So as we seek to give to God's work, we need to not neglect giving to our family, providing for our family. Sometimes we think about ministry and we think about discipling people, evangelizing, witnessing, and we're always just thinking out there, someone else. When often the people that we can be most witnessing to and discipling might be right there within our family. And we need to not neglect that. Our family often can be the best opportunities we'll have to disciple and witness and even show sacrificial giving to. So first here we see we need to give to our family. Remember that God wants us to provide for their needs. But an important point of clarifying here is we're to provide for their needs, not their greeds, not all their wants. And that's important. There's a difference between providing and wasteful indulgence. So that's the first group. Who should we give to? We are to provide for our family. Secondly, we are to give to God's people in need. That's the, the picture that we've seen in this passage already and some of the other passages that we've looked at. And this is often the way that giving is talked about in the New Testament. About seven years ago, I did a skim through the New Testament, looking at all the passages that talk about money and giving. And the interesting thing that I saw as I did that was most of the examples that came up always related back to giving to God's people who were in need. In particular, most of the examples that came up were giving to God's people in need. This was the majority of the examples that are used in the New Testament relating to giving. And here's a few, just to give you that picture. In Acts 2, at the end, verse 42 to 47, we see the early church shares what they have. They are together in common sharing to provide for those who are in need. In Romans chapter 12, verse 13, it says, share with God's people who are in need. And then a bunch of other passages like Romans 15, the end of our passage, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Acts 11, Galatians 2, and others, they all talk about this collection to go to the Jerusalem church who were God's people in need. So again and again, we see in the New Testament this giving spoken of as something that should be done to God's people who are in need. Now, there are other instances that we're about to see, but for the majority, that's often what is referred to. Now, when I saw that, I asked the question, why is that important? Why is it so important that Our giving happens to God's people who are in need. Well, I think it's because in doing that, like we saw in Romans 15, it unites believers. It shows we are a family. It models the sacrificial love of Christ as we care for one another and for other Christians in need. And it's important too because Jesus says, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. 
So it's important. It's an important aspect of our giving. Second, uh, thirdly, though, another aspect of our giving is to give to missionaries or to those teaching others God's word. And we see instances of this as well through the New Testament in Philippians chapter 4 at the end. Paul, he's thankful for that church because they gave to him aid when he was in need, when he was teaching others God's word and they supplied his needs. Also in 3 John, um, you could read verse 5 to 8, but I'll just read the end there. It talked about how in verse 8, it says, We ought to therefore show hospitality to such men so that we may work together for the truth. And here it was talking about men who had gone out for the sake of the name, for the sake of Jesus' name, to spread his name. And so then, John is calling here, we ought to show hospitality to such men who have gone out to do this. And so part of our giving needs to involve giving to those who have gone out to reach the lost. Gone out, those who have gone out to reach the unreached people of this world. We are to give to missionaries, to this important work so that all nations, all people are reached with the gospel. And then a fourth group. We could look at others, but a fourth group that comes up often in the New Testament that we are to give to is we are to give to our church or the place where we are taught God's word. We're to give to our church. One verse, Galatians 6 verse 6 says, Anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. So if you're here listening tonight or if you're going to watch this sermon online, if someone watches this online, or if they're benefiting from the ministries of this church or the teaching of this church, then there's a call here in this passage to support that work, to support those who are teaching and to support the church that is bringing this teaching. We're not just to take and gain, but we are also to give. And that's because we realize things cost money. Money, it's, we need money to run a church. Lights cost, electricity costs, streaming services costs, maintaining buildings costs, running ministries cost. And so if we're benefiting from a church, we are to give to that church. Look again at the verse, it says, anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. So from the, with the church and with those instructing. And so if you're just here receiving and never giving and always just taking, then you need to realize you're hindering God's work and taking and not giving back in that place where God's kingdom can be spreading. And you also need to realize you're actually robbing yourself of blessing because we know Jesus says, we know it is more blessed to give than to receive. So that's who we can be giving to, who we should be giving to, we see in the Bible. But then the next question comes, what do we give? How much do we give? This is the next question in my mind. Is there an amount that we are to give to these things? Well, in the Old Testament, maybe you know, the Israelites had that principle of the tithe, giving 10% of what they earned and had. But this doesn't carry across anywhere in the New Testament we see. Instead, I think there's a, a greater principle that drives our giving. And it's the fact that our giving is motivated and driven by what we have been given in Christ. That's what drives our giving. As Christians, we aren't just to give a, a certain percentage to God. Instead, we are to give our all to Him. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20 says, You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. He owns us. We are His. And all that we have is His. It's his money. It's his resources. And so everything should be in our lives, everything should be surrendered to him, surrendered to his purposes, not just a small little percentage or a part. All of it should. But as we do that, as we surrender all to him, it will mean at times we use money to pay for our needs. We may use money to pay for the food that we need so we have the energy to serve him. We may use money to pay for the bills, for the car or for our house, to be able to serve him and do ministry with those things. We'll use money to give to God's work. But in all of it, we're seeking to give to God and to his purposes, no matter how we're using it. And so as Christians, we shouldn't be just thinking about giving this little set amount, but we should have an attitude that seeks to surrender everything we have to Jesus, surrender all that we have to his purposes. 
and what he wants to be done with them. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. It's a well-known verse, but I think for us it raises a helpful principle to, to help you show, to show you what you should use to guide your giving. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, so whatever you do, whether you eat or whether you drink, or whether you spend money or whether you give money away, do it all to the glory of God. When we apply this to giving, I think the key principle is that we should always use our money for whatever brings most glory to God. Use your money for whatever brings most glory to God. So we spend money on our needs at times because that will bring most glory to God. So we have energy to serve Him. We give at times because that will bring most glory to God. So what do we give? What do we give as we answer this question? We give everything. We surrender all to His purposes because all that we spend and give is God's. Now, it's a bit of background on giving. Back to the passage now, verse 2. I want to, the next question I want to answer, and the passage directly answers this one. How should we give? What should guide our giving? Well, verse 2 here raises some principles. First, the first principle in verse 2 we see is that we are to regularly give. Verse 2 says, 1 Corinthians 16, it says that this collection was to happen on the first day of the week. That's Sunday, when they remembered the resurrection of Jesus. And now this is pointing to an early practice that the Christians had then to gather together, to worship God on the Lord's day. And it's referenced a couple of times through the New Testament. And so here we're seeing they are to regularly give and they're to regularly give money, setting it aside for this church in Jerusalem, for those who are in need, each day, each Sunday, regularly. Secondly, the second principle here that we see about giving is that all should give. The next phrase that comes in verse 2, have a look, it says, each one of you. And this shows that the act of giving was for everyone to be a part of. It wasn't just for the rich in the church. It wasn't just for those who are really zealous for Jesus. No, we see here that it didn't matter what situation people were in or the poverty that some may have even been in. All were to give. Nothing excluded anyone from giving. And this is important to remember, we should always seek to give, even when we may have very little. Because if we can't give when we have very little, we probably won't have the willingness to give when we have much. And so here, all should give. All should be a part of this work. Thirdly, what should guide our giving? Well, here we see the third point is that we should plan to give. Verse 2, Paul tells the Corinthians to set aside a sum of money. And in, later in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, Paul says, Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So how much we give is something that we should pray about and plan and willingly do and decide before the Lord. Paul wants them to set something aside each week, but he wants them to willingly do this not reluctant, reluctantly, and we need to plan to give. If we don't plan to give and you just leave it to that moment when it might happen, then you probably won't give as much as if you had regularly done it or you might forget completely and won't give at all. But when we plan to give and we set aside what we will give, then we regularly give an amount that is wise and how God wants us to use our money. And I think that's part of the reason why there's a regularity here and a planning here because God wants us to steward our money well. And part of that involves planning. Fourthly, in verse 2, Paul says, each one of you should give in keeping with his income, saving it up. Now, the point here, I think, is that we are to give as we are able. We are to give as we are able. Think Some think this may just refer to a proportionate amount of your income and that's what you give and that's what it's talking about. But the original phrase here is more seeking to show that as God prospers us, we should also seek to give more. As God gives and prospers us more, we should seek to give more. As you earn more, you should seek to give more and not just a greater amount because you're earning more, but even a greater percentage. Because as we earn more, We could use more for us or we could use more for God. The more God gives to us, the more we should seek to give to him 
And we need to realize here at this point that it's not about the amount. It's not about the percentage. But it's more often about how much are we keeping for ourselves. Oswald Chambers says this, I think very helpfully. He says, With Christ, it is not how much we give, but what we do not give. That is the real test. Sometimes we can earn more and and then just keep it all because we're giving that percentage, maybe we think. But oftentimes, if we have more, we should be able to give even more. Fifth principle here, giving should be generous and sacrificial. Our giving should be generous and sacrificial. Paul says there in verse 2 that he wants the people to regularly set aside money so that when I come, he says, when I come, no collections will have to be made. Now, there's probably a few reasons behind that, but I think certainly implied in it is generosity and sacrificial giving because if they've been giving in such a generous way way regularly, then Paul won't need to collect when he comes. They've already given all that is needed. But also we see this point in other verses, in 2 Corinthians 9. And you'll notice I'm referencing 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 a lot. They're key passages on giving. But 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. We are to give generously self-sacrificially, as Christ gave to us. We should even at times give beyond what we are able. God commends that kind of giving. At the beginning of 2 Corinthians 8, the Macedonians gave beyond what they were able. And in Mark 12, the woman with the last two copper coins gave all that she had. We should even give beyond what we are able because our giving should be generous, costly and sacrificial. And then a final point of what our giving should be like. Our giving should be cheerful and willing. We've already seen it, haven't we? In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And you notice in our passage too, in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul doesn't demand them to give or say how much to give. He just wants to motivate them to give willingly. And that is so important in our giving. We are to give willingly and cheerfully. If we aren't, if we don't give with love and willingness, then we are missing the point as we give. And there's probably no point in giving. So this is how the money was to be collected there with the Corinthian church. These are some of the principles that should have guided how they collected the money, but also their giving and how they gave. But there is one other question that Paul answers, I think, in our passage, and that's in verse 3 and 4. And that's the question of how should the money be distributed? How should the money be distributed? Well, verse 3 says, Then when I arrive, says Paul, I will give letters of introduction to the men who you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. So the church was to designate and approve people to take this gift. Paul wants representatives from the church to do this. And this is probably important so that he's not accused or he's not the only one doing this and the only one involved because he wants to stay above reproach. But also this is important, I think, too, so that those who receive it in Jerusalem see who the gift is coming from. And when they see who the gift is coming from and they see these representatives, then that unity creates, is created And that bond is created between these churches and between God's people, which is a point we already looked at. So Paul wants these representatives to be sent, but also, he says in verse 4, he's willing to go. If it's best, he is willing to go. Verse 4 says, If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. As in, they're going to come with me and we'll go together then. And if you remember back in Romans 15, Acts 24, 17, it shows that This trip did happen. Paul did go and the gift was taken to the church in Jerusalem. And and then we see the end of the story. So this here is a a pattern here of giving and how we should give. It's a picture here that we as God's people should give to God's people who are in need. That's the main point, as we said at the beginning. We as God's people should give to God's people who are in need. They may be among us. They definitely will be away from us in other lands. So many people, so many of God's people in desperate need, in desperate need. 
And so may we seek for this kind of giving to happen in our lives more and more. I know many of you do this well. Praise God for how you do this. Let's seek it more and more. And to help you do this and to help me do this, as I was thinking through this passage, I was thinking through reasons why to give. Now, I'm not going to lay out all the ones that I came up with and thought through, but I just want to give you one. The main reason why we should give. The greatest reason why we should give generously to God's kingdom and may it motivate you to give in these kind of ways. Why should we give? Well, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, that, that key passage on giving, as I've said, Paul is encouraging there the Corinthians to excel in the grace of giving. And as he does this, he says why. He says why in verse 9. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Here's why you should give generously. Because Jesus suffered a cruel death. He gave and became poor so that we could enjoy the richness of being with God again. The richness of forgiven sin and eternal life with Him. He became poor and suffered a cruel death so we could enjoy that wonderful inheritance that is awaiting us. And so we are able to freely give because of what we've been given, because of how we've been given so much in Christ. Matthew Henry, he says this, The good we receive from Jesus should stir us up to do good to others, to resemble him in our benevolence. And therefore, the more good we receive from God, the more we should do good to others. And that applies to giving. We love, says John, because he first loved us. We give because he first gave to us. He gave his life so that we may have eternal life with him. So can I challenge you, with your money, with your resources, with how you give, may you proclaim the wonder of all you have been given and the worth of Jesus in how you use your money. May you, like Moses, who disregarded the, who regarded the disgrace of uh, the value of the treasures in Egypt, who regarded these as disgrace because he was looking forward to a greater reward. May you, like that, like Moses, regard the great treasures of this world. For Moses, it was the great treasures of Egypt. He regarded them as nothing because of the great reward that he was awaiting. May we too do that because we're looking ahead at that greater inheritance. When we give, may we display the value that we see in Christ and and show that we really believe he's worth far more than money. So Christian, you have a great inheritance in Jesus. Proclaim now, proclaim now in how you give the worth of the inheritance that you have in Jesus. And to close, may I, let me close with this quote. Roger Babson, he says, and may this encourage you to invest into eternity and give to God's kingdom as you lay up treasures in heaven. He says this, one dollar spent towards lunch last five hours. One dollar spent on a necktie last five weeks. I don't know, maybe you can put something else instead of a necktie. And he says then, one dollar spent for a cap lasts five months. One dollar spent for a car lasts five years. One dollar spent for a railroad lasts five decades. But one dollar spent in God's service lasts for eternity. Let's invest into eternity and seek to give to what really lasts and use our money in a way that will really last because we've been given so much in Christ, haven't we? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your son who became poor so that we could be rich and have a great inheritance. 
Thank you for the future hope that we have. Thank you for the forgiveness of, of sin that we can enjoy right now. And we pray, God, that the richness of all that we have experienced in Christ would help us to richly give to your kingdom. Please set us free from the grip of money. Please, God, may our heart not be gripped by what money may bring, but may we be gripped by the worth of all that we have in Jesus. And we pray, God, that you would help us to show the worth of Jesus in how we use our money, our time, our gifts, our resources, our everything. Please may we show your worth in how we use these things. And we pray this for your glory. Amen.